Hi folks, this is Dungeon Master 77.1. I'm only 9 years old, so I don't know what a corset is. But you do, and you should go check out subculturecorsets.com. Use the code The Horror Show with Ryan Keen at checkout, and you'll get 10% off your order. How's that, Dad? That was pretty good, buddy. Now can I have my own podcast? We'll see. Hey listeners, this is Gavin Dillinger. If you recently searched for The Horror Show with Brian Keene on iTunes, you may not have been able to get it up. I would like to apologize for that. It appears that while I was advertising my serialized novel, Good Boy, I may have violated some terms of service, and iTunes keeps a firm grip on that content. I would especially like to apologize to Brian and Dave as they work long and hard on a podcast that is throbbing with content, insight, and information. And it's simply not fair to them that because of my actions, iTunes would look at their podcast and jerk it off the site. Once again, I would like to apologize to all of those who have been inconvenienced by this. Penis. No comment! Sir, what about the ending to The Rising? Mother f- what part of no comment don't you understand? Do you understand this? This interview is over. No comment. The f- Brian Keene was also unavailable for comment. Hi folks, this is Brian Keene and you're listening to the best of the horror show with Brian Keene. This is take, Mary, what take number is this? Take four. Um, And that's because I'm angry and I'm flustered. Uh, You know, Dave and myself and Mary and Lombardo and Coop and Dungeon Master and Phoebe, we work every week to bring you a a brand new original show uh, that will entertain you and inform you. Unfortunately, due to circumstances beyond our control, uh, we are unable to do that at this time. Uh, if you don't know why, go to the horror show with BrianKeen.com, click the Show Archives tab at the top, and scroll down to the last original episode entitled Bad Apple. That will tell you everything you need to know. Uh, a more up-to-date explanation, yes, I know the problem has been resolved for some of our listeners. However, it has not been resolved for all of our listeners. And the problem is now impacting other platforms that the show can be heard on. Um, Until everything is resolved, I cannot, in good conscience, uh, record new shows. We have a lot of breaking news stories that that we need to get to, and I don't want folks to miss them. Uh, I don't want folks to miss that information. So what we're going to do is we're going to run a few best ofs. This week's episode, uh, from April 16th of 2015... Uh, we're going to listen to Paul Goblish, the head and CEO of Thunderstorm Books, uh, one of my favorite small presses. And then after Paul, uh, we're going to have a classic interview from uh, May 12th of 2016, the legendary Jack Ketchum one-on-one with me. Um, and Dave will be here as well to, to read the advertisements to you. So, you know, those are the most important part of the show, if you ask Dave. <laughs> Hi, Dave. Um, so anyway, let's get to that. Here's Paul Goblish. Or maybe here's Dave with an ad first. I'm not sure. Either way, it's going to be entertaining. This week's show is brought to you by the following. Pinky swears and double dog dares. Spit in your hand and shake. Tonight we ride. Hold tight, don't slide. That'd be your last mistake. Creposa Woods is a spooky dark place, even in the daytime. There are creepy crawlies and slithery slimies lurking behind every tree and under every rock, ready to reach out and snatch you away, never to be heard from again. 
Ghosts float in the misty fog that hangs in the air amid the branches. Some say serial killers and psychopaths bury their unsuspecting victims in shallow graves way far back from the cycle path that meanders through it, and the ghosts are all that remain. Are you scared yet, Frady Cats? Cool, then grab your bikes and let's go for the ride of your lives. Meanderings of a dark and lonely cycle path, uh, or, um, psychopath. Randy D's third dark poetry collection can be found at all the normal book buying locations, and several copies are buried in the shallow grave way far back from the cycle path. That's if you're really dying to read it. Pick up your paperback copy or Kindle ebook copy and give this horror poem tome a good home. Horror fiction fans, brace yourselves for the double barrel horror volume two from Pint Bottle Press. The entire second series of chapbooks is now available in a single paperback anthology, as well as for your Kindle device. Six talented authors bring you 12 twisted tales for twice the nightmares. Edited by Matthew Weber, this pulse-pounding anthology includes two stories each from John Bowden, Simon Dewar, Patrick Freivald, Chad Lutsky, Karen Runge, and M.B. Vuchasek. Shane D. Keene of Shotgun Logic writes, like the dual blasts from a sawed-off shotgun, these 12 stories pack a brain-shedding wallop that kept me turning pages as fast as my fingers could tap the screen. Also available from Pint Bottle Press is the original Double Barrel Horror Collection, featuring six different authors, 12 hair-raising stories, and enough thrills and chills to choke a corpse. Pick up the Double Barrel Horror Anthologies at Amazon today. Only eleven ninety nine for paperback and two ninety nine for Kindle. And find more horror fiction at pintbottlepress.com. And this segment of the horror show is brought to you by Thomas F. Monteleone's Mafia. That's M period A period F period I period A period. Yes, I had to think about how to spell Mafia. That's because I am here in Tucson, Arizona for the Festival of Books. And I have been drinking all weekend courtesy of uh, pre-reader Mr. Todd Clark, who is here hanging out in the background of the studio. Tell the folks hi, Todd. Hi. Okay. They can't see you wave. Can't see me wave? <laughs> what, what are you drinking right now? I am drinking Belching Beaver. Belching Beaver, ladies and gentlemen. And I think that just sums up this entire weekend so far. Uh, joining me this half hour is Paul Goblersh. Paul founded Thunderstorm Books in 2008 specializing in signed, limited edition, collectible hardcovers. He's published books by myself, Ronald Kelly, Brian Smith, Mary San Giovanni, F. Paul Wilson, Sarah Pinborough, Nate Southard, Kelly Owen, J.F. Gonzalez, Rath James White, Andy Dean, Ronald Malfi, and many, many more. I'd also like to point out on a personal note, Paul and Thunderstorm Books are one of the very few limited edition uh, small press publishers that actively work with new unpublished authors. And I think that is to be commended. Welcome to the show, Paul. Thank you, Brian. I'm glad to be here. You look nervous. I am nervous. You're nervous? Tell, say you're nervous again. I want to look at your mic level here. I'm nervous. Okay, yeah. It's picking up that you're nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I guess my, my first question, and it's probably the question – of everybody on the internet is, did I mangle your last name, the pronunciation of it? Uh, my last name is Goblish. Goblish, ladies Goblish. and gentlemen. Silent R, silent C. Right now, there's a bunch of people out there that, that just won some money. Uh, there were betting odds on this. I, so, I imagine so. So, Goblish. Goblish. And I would like to point out to Miss Kelly Owen, if you're listening, that you were wrong. <laughs> Kelly's always wrong. You know that. Dude. Kelly's always wrong. You heard it here, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Kelly Owen is always wrong. All right. Um, usually when I'm interviewing a writer, a fellow writer, obviously one of my first questions is going to be, who were their influences? But you are a publisher. Were there certain publishing houses? Were there certain companies that influenced and inspired you to do this? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um before I became a publisher, I was very heavy into book collecting and specifically signed limited editions. So I was collecting things like Cemetery Dance, uh, Delirium Books, uh, Larry Roberts, Bloodletting Press, Don Korsh's Necessary Evil Press. And all of them had an influence on me. Um, 
a huge shout out goes, a lot of people ask me, hey, you know, who do you compare yourself to? And um, in some ways, I think of myself kind of like Necro Publications was back in the the late 90s, early aughts. I see with, that. Dave, Dave Barnett's, Barnett's company. Company. Yeah. company. So um, Dave's doing different things now, than, so maybe that comparison isn't the exact. But back then, I, I kind of compare myself to him, and he, he was a uh, huge influence as well. So there's definitely influences. And then I won't mention names, but then you get the ones that the fly-by-nights that do things improperly, and you learn – from their mistakes and hopefully you don't make those mistakes when you start or you, you're allowed to mention names if you want to no that's no? I, okay I, I, we can <laughs> if you want to know the the origin of thunderstorm i'm willing to share that yeah go ahead so there was a australian publisher named uh wild roses and um they were publishing something called a premiere series and that series um they came out with two books in that one was rage by steve gerlach and The Last Motel by Brett McBean. Yeah. And I bought both of those on the secondary market for a handsome price. And I was going along, and there was supposed to be six of them. And I was going along and, and trying to find out where I can get the six and where I can make sure I can buy them. Um, book five was The Wicked by James Newman. And I finally secured a copy of that. And I read that he was kind of pulling out on the deal. And that Wild Roses were having their problems, and they didn't really publish that many books. And I went upstairs, and I was in the, and I actually was looking in the bathroom mirror, and I said to myself, "What if I published it?" And that got the ball rolling. Right. Of how to become a publisher? Now I didn't go out and email James the next day. What I did was I researched it. I watched what publishers said. I watched what publishers do. I watched what authors reactions were to publishers how artists interacted with publishers and this was back in the 2000s where all this stuff is online on message boards and whatnot right so i i went through those steps and um by the time uh, i was kind of ready to go uh necessary evil ended up publishing that book which i was thrilled about because all those covers had keith minion covers and and necessary evil used that cover which i was very pleased with and so I started, you know, communicating with Don. And That's Don Don Koish of Necessary Evil? Don Koish of okay. Necessary Evil. And he really showed me the ropes. I mean, and if and he helped me out a lot. And I don't think there would be a thunderstorm if he wasn't there in the beginning to show me, you know, just aspects of publishing that you don't really think about of, you know, how much shipping is an impact, how much certain hidden fees are impacts and you know obstacles to overcome so right that's how thunderstorm started it was started because another press basically folded so. yeah <laughs> I, I don koish you know i know there's there are some bad feelings for him among some of our peers um but you know i i, I always thought he was a good guy he was an honorable guy he would give you the shirt off his back absolutely you know, some people, they just, they burn out after a while. They don't want to do this for the rest of their lives. And, and I don't see anything wrong with that. Um, you know, but yeah, it sounds like he got, he, he got you cause you, you've been successful. You've yeah. Been very gotten, successful. I don't know. I've gotten, I think I've done over 120 books by now. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know the exact count. But yeah. I think it is over 120. Yeah. The shirt on my back has a hundred on it. Yeah. So. <laughs> I know I'm over that. And I, I would agree with you. Uh, the comparison to Necro Publications, I think, is apt and fair. Uh, I'll always have a soft spot for Dave. Um, you know, he was he was the first limited edition I ever bought uh, was from Dave. It was Edward Lee's The Big Head. Oh, there you go. Yeah, the original. I have that one, too. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, Dave, I just, in corresponding with him, he turned me on to all this other stuff and yeah, I didn't even know that. I mean, I knew the small press existed, but I didn't know just how much was there and how much was available until Dave and Necro. And you look back on the glory days, you know, he was publishing all the Lee and Peelin collaborations and Charlie Jacob, you know, Bell Wilson's first book. I mean, some historic stuff came out of that that house. Yes, it did. And he took risks. That yes, other he did. publishers wouldn't touch. So Absolutely. I kind of respected him for that. Well, and you do that too. I, I mentioned at the, the beginning of this interview, you work 
with a lot of, you know, new untested authors. You know, that's that's the thing with with a limited edition collectible audience. Yeah, there may only be 300 copies, but those 300 copies are 50 bucks a pop. You you have to sell almost all of those to to you make to, your money. You have to sell all of them. Yeah, you have to sell all of them and and it's a risk anytime you do that with a new or untested author and yet you've published a lot of them. Yeah, I never wanted that to hold me back. Um, one of the best thrills I've had is opening up now, when I was a book collector, is opening up a book. Because I would spend the 50 bucks on a new author. I didn't mind. But opening up a manuscript from a newer author and just being totally immersed into the story. And if they can do that and it's a new voice that I haven't heard before, it's really a thrill. So I've, you know... Not all my copies are 300 copies. A lot of them are much smaller. But what I'm trying to do is just make sure that I'm representing authors the right way. Right. And if that means, you know, that means simple things, you know, pay them on time. And, you know, come out with a book within a reasonable amount of time and have it be a display case in their house. I mean, one of my goals for an author is is you have mass markets and you have these ebooks and you have these things that the amount of sales is paramount in in making those successes and with a small press especially a micro press such as thunderstorm it isn't necessarily the amount of sales it's it's more i want them to show off their book if their in-laws are over they're not going to open up their computer and go to the kindle amazon page and say there's my book. They're going to go pull it off the shelf and say, you know, this is my book. And it's leather and it has specialty end sheets and it's signed and it's there's color in it. And there's usually there's, you know, artwork on it that's, you know, a step above, say, just a, a digitally designed cover. Right. Things like that. And that and that's primarily my goal. And new authors, I think, um, really help. Uh, really help drive what I'm, what my goals are, and what I'm aiming to do. I think that's noble. And I, as a reader, I've, you know, I get sent books all the time. I mean, every week I go to my PO box, and there's usually at least a dozen, sometimes two dozen, you know, books by new authors. Now, you know, quite honestly, I just I don't have time to read them all. I, I would never have time to read them all. I try to get to as many as I can. But uh, what I do like is when I get a new shipment of books from you and it's an author I've never heard of before. Nine times out of ten, I, I end up enjoying the book. You mm -hmm. have a good eye for talent. Um, and I think what really impresses me, much like Don Daria with the Leisure Books line, you're all over the place. There's not just one type of horror you're publishing. Um, you know, you'll, you'll do the, the extreme bizarro stuff like Shane McKenzie, you know, but then you'll turn around and, and publish these, these, you know, quiet, supernatural, eerie books. Um, I'm going to forget the author's name, P.A. Uh, P.A. Douglas. P.A. Douglas. That was it. Never heard of this gentleman before. Uh, the book arrived from you and it, it blew me away. It knocked my socks off. Um, I'm blanking on the title because, you know, Todd had me up drinking all last night. But it was actually The Hitchers. The Hitchers. That's it. That's it. And it was a great cover. Um, now, I I don't know if you can speak to this or not. Do you know if, if P.A. Douglas has plans to do that in Kindle or paperback? Or? Actually, I ended up doing the reprint on that. So Did that you? is already in Amazon. And I think, I know it's an Amazon ebook. I believe it's a paperback. Okay. Well. I'm not too keen on the ebook market i'm a pretty much limited edition guy but yeah i know he has that album on amazon so if you missed out on the thunderstorm edition yeah check it out cool excellent so were you were you a horror fan growing up i mean were you always a horror fan is it something you came to later in life actually this is kind of a funny story um when i was in fourth grade i broke my leg badly i'll even Showing the, Holy shit. Yeah, showing the scars off to the, the audience here. <laughs> and uh, I was laid up for a while, and I started um, reading a lot because I w couldn't be outside. Now, for a lot of you younger folks out there, when it was summertime and it was daylight and you were a kid, you were not in the house. And 
this is back in the early 80s. Um, you just weren't in the house. So I'm laid up all summer and I couldn't really be outside. We lived way out in the country and I started reading. So I was getting into stuff like um, the three investigators and choose your own adventures and Hardy Boys and stuff like that. And that's really where I developed my love of reading. I after my leg healed, I kind of went back. I, uh, when I would turn like 13, I kind of got into comic books. And then when I turned 15, I got out of comic books and they just didn't do anything for me anymore. And I pretty much didn't read after that. I was, you know, a college student. And when you're a college student, you, you read your textbooks and that's about it. Um, and then later on, I found Stephen King's um, The Green Mile serial novel that was your first king that was my first king i found it on a grocery store display rack right at the end where they want you to do a impulse buy and i was impulsive and i'm like <laughs> they had the shiny number one it was the dead girls because it came out in six monthly parts right shiny number one just like my choose your own adventures and i just okay and as soon as I picked that up, and this is after college, this was, well, it might not have been after college, but it was late in college. And I picked that up and I started devouring those. And then next thing you know, I'm buying hardcovers. And next thing you know, I'm discovering the small press and the rest is history. Cool. So when you, when you took the plunge, what was the process? I mean, you talked about Don gave you advice. Um, but I mean, did you go to your wife and say, I want to do this? And did she tell you you were crazy? And I mean, how did you come up with the starter money? What, uh, let's say somebody out there is listening right now and they're like, hey, I, I don't want to be a writer. I want to be a publisher. What do you, what, how do you get started? Um, the advice I would have if, if you want to become a publisher, and I really can't speak too well to the, to the paperback ebook model. I know that model does not require as much startup money. It doesn't require nearly. And that's why I think limited editions are going to be even more limited in the future. Because if you're a person that wants to publish and you don't care what type of book you publish, you just want to publish, it's going to be a lot more advantageous to just do a, do an ebook and do a, a paperback where if you don't sell it, you're, you don't have an inventory. Right. Um, but if you want to get into limited editions, yeah, you should set aside money. Now, I made huge mistakes when I was starting. I made huge mistakes. Um, but there are enough right things that I did that set me up for success. And I will explain those. And then I'll explain, you know, <laughs> how I broke my own rules. But my, my thing coming out of the gate was no more than two to start. I was going to only contract two books. I wasn't going to go out and contract a dozen books thinking that I knew what all these heroes of mine already knew. It, it's a process. You have to learn and you have to, and it's going to take a long time when you do your first couple books. So my rule was two. So I contacted Brian Smith for the house of blood. Now this was already a reprint, which was another thing I was, I wanted to do a reprint first just right. to, you know, get my feet wet. And, oh, my gosh, did that book take forever. If, if you ever interview Brian on the show, he'll probably tell you that it's thunderstorm. I did not have a website when I contacted him. Yeah. I did not. I was a nobody. I didn't have anything. I didn't have any experience. Um, but he was pretty cool through the process. And it took me forever and a year to, to actually come up with that book. The second person I contacted was Brett McBean. He, he had a book called The Mother um, that was published in Australia. And, oh, my gosh, I really wanted that book. So we, we, we talked for a while, and that book was going to come out, but he kind of convinced me to do a short story collection. Now, the startup money, um, I sold some of my personal collection, and then I had some. Um, but my mistake was I was not crystal clear with my wife about my plans. Right. And it, and when she listens to this, she's going to probably shake her head <laughs> and she's going to get upset because my first conversation with her was after a box of a book called Just Like Hell showed up on the front doorstep. 
Just Like Hell by Nate Southerd. That's correct. Which you published. That's my first published book. But that that was not your first published book, was it? It was the first published book. Yeah? It ended okay. up being my, and I broke that rule and because it was a smaller title and it didn't cost as much to, to print and bind. It shows up on my doorstep and then we had a conversation. <laughs> oh, Jesus. And, I tell you, if you are interested in publishing, sit down with your spouse or your significant other and plan it all out in advance because that was the dumbest thing I've ever done. How, how did she react? She was not happy. I mean, it, she she wasn't happy. I, it was it was a it was a shithead thing to do. I mean, it really was, and uh, I regretted it. I still regret it. Eight years later, and I'm successful now, and we're successful. She's just as much a part of Thunderstorm as I am, and I still regret it to this day. But um, it kept me driven because can you imagine if I failed? Can you imagine the wrath? Oh, I can imagine. I, I, well, I remember the first time I met your wife. I believe it was, uh, I believe it was World Horror Austin. That's correct. I think, and uh, she, she, one of the first things she said to me, she thanked me, and I said, "What are you thanking me for?" And she said, "You bought me a new washing machine." And I need a new dryer, so I hope you'll publish with this. <laughs> <laughs> that is accurate. Yeah. That is correct. It was actually yes. Um, after I uh, we came out with Maelstrom One, which was Gathering of Crows, Kelly Owens' Six Days, and The Rising Deliverance. After we came out with that set, I bought her a uh, dishwasher. We needed a dishwasher quite badly. Yeah. And that was the first time I took money from books and went out and bought something external. Up to that point, it wasn't that I wasn't profitable, but I was trying to expand. I was pouring every cent I got in, I was pouring right back into the business. And then that's the other thing. You have to have enough patience in the beginning to see the end, not the end, but you got to see ahead of far enough to know that you're not going to take your first book money and go blow it all on something and then start from scratch again if you want to be successful. You have to reinvest in your business. And I did that for about two and a half years. But Maelstrom One, that was the first time I ever bought something with the money I yeah. earned, and it was a dishwasher, a Bosch dishwasher. It was a nice one. Silent it's, running it's, modes and, and that, all that. That finally convinced her that you'd made a, a good finally, decision. I don't think um, the Just Like Hell discussion came up after that. I think that was that kind of sealed the deal. Well, so. Good. So, you know, all you people out there that, you know, you go on Tumblr and Facebook and message boards and you know you like to talk about what an asshole i am you just remember i kept these people's marriage together motherfuckers so, <laughs> i didn't mean to make you choke on your beer Paul. <laughs> so i mean obviously it's not all fun and games and and obviously you're not making money with every book now i know the the collectible small press it's kind of gone through an implosion since Around 2009, 2010, you know, Delirium Books, uh, Bloodletting, they they changed their business models. A lot of other publishers just completely shut down. And I mean, you know, you look at the field now, it's it's Cemetery Dance, Subterranean, Yourself, Sinister Grin, and like uh, PS Publishing and maybe two or three others. And that's it. Uh, Bad Moon, I guess they're still publishing. Um how did you how did you survive that how i mean how how i well yeah i mean <laughs> there's a there's a couple parts to this question that i'd like to get into but okay the first part of of how i survived you know i think taking care of your customer is of the utmost importance followed maybe tied for first is taking care of the author if you can keep your authors happy and your customers happy you're at least on the right track. And like you said, maybe not every title will be successful. But, and this is just my opinion, but sometimes publishers get into their business mode so much that they don't realize that there's an end customer who's going to open up that box. And if you want them to open up the next box, you have to provide them with enough customer service and you have to provide them with a product that they want to continue to buy. It's not just a one book, one book, one book, one book. It's a series of, of books that come out every month or bi-monthly or, you know, 
um, on a regular basis. On a regular basis, and you want them to return. Um, and when they don't return, then I'm not doing my job correctly, and I have to figure out other methods to to either have them come back or find find new customers. Um, so if you don't put the customer first, a, you're going to struggle. And I'm not saying these other presses that folded didn't. I'm just saying that um, I have any, I think, a, a unique um, relationship with my customers. I have a lot of them contact me, and I I talk with them in emails. I share insights to the inside of thunderstorm. Um, and I want them to come back. And, and hopefully, you know, the other part of it is, is hopefully my product stands up to what they're, what they're purchasing. You know, I mean, I want their book to be nice and I'm going to do my every effort to make a, a nice book at the end of the uh, end of the day. Yeah. Todd, I see you over there nodding. You, you bought a lot of books from Paul, right? Yeah. I uh, actually met Paul online, I think through shock lines originally when he was uh, goes by PG and uh, he actually, when the first books that he was publishing were books that I, of authors I was really interested in. So I've been buying from him from day one, actually. Uh, I know the first three books you mentioned, I all of them are sitting on my shelf. So. No, they're sitting on mine, too. Absolutely. I, I could also uh, vouch to his customer service. Uh, I'm one of the guys that's always bugging him, send him an email. Hey, did I buy this book yet? I can't remember. <laughs> and so he's he's. Uh, I've got many emails from Paul at about 5 a.m. I think he uh, checks his email real early in the morning and lets me know that yeah, you did buy that book. If you are getting it, so I don't buy two of them. <laughs> and and you do that a lot of that without a social media presence. I mean, you're on Twitter, but I don't. Unless I'm mistaken, you're not on Facebook, right? The only reason I'm on Twitter was a guy named Brian Keene. Oh, no. (laughs) It's like, how do I contact Brian Keene? Well, i got to open up a Twitter account. That's the best (laughs) way, man, but you know the secret. So I did. Um, Yeah, I'm I'm probably not a marketing genius. I mean, every publisher has their their strengths and their weaknesses, and uh, I'm not really into the social media thing. uh, you could tell me I should be, and I would probably agree with you, but I like the neighborhood bar establishment I've made. So I consider my publishing company a neighborhood bar. And if I know you, you can come on in and we're old friends. And if I don't know you, you can come on in and we'll become friends. Norm! <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I'm not going to be the guy who's going to end up selling chicken strips and video games to get the family in and i'm going to spread across all 50 states i'm going to be the neighborhood bar guy so right so uh what what do you think about some of the changes in the in the field i mean where do you see would you agree with me that the the market for limited edition collectible hardcovers is shrinking oh absolutely yeah and uh and i never did get to the second part of that question you asked me earlier but if you haven't read this book called Leader of the Band by Brian King, you should go out and do so because – Except it's not in print anymore. It, it might not be in print, but you can find one on eBay. Um, a lot of the predictions in that book, which was published in – what was it, 2008, Brian? 2008 we published that, yep. Came true. Well, I and wish one not. One of the things that Brian pointed out in that book that I 100% agree with was this collapse of the small press, or if you want to call it that, was going to happen regardless of the global economic downturn of 2009 or not. And it was going to happen anyway. Now, what happened is a lot of collectors and a lot of people in the book industry married up the two concepts and thought, well, the economy went to crap, so that's why the small press collapsed. (laughs) That is not true. My opinion on why the small press collapsed is there is way, way too many people buying books for one of two reasons. They were buying books thinking they were going to go up in value and they were going to put their kids through college or it was an investment. I'm going to hold on to it for three years and sell it for double or whatever those cases may be. The other reason people bought those books was I'm going to read it. I don't really like the book itself as a physical entity. I just want the story. There wasn't a lot of other 
outlets for for a ton of small press authors. So I'm gonna buy the book. I'm gonna flip it basically. I'm gonna sell it right away. Now these things are okay, but when they happen to such an extreme, it becomes very top heavy. That yeah. was gonna collapse no matter what happened with the economy. And you see that today. The economy, it's maybe not perfect, but it's a lot better than it was in 2009. Yep. A lot better. And you don't see these huge print runs like we saw in the mid-2000s. We don't see these people buying book and then two months later selling it for five times the amount they bought the, the, the purchase price. Agreed. So if you kind of understand that, that doesn't mean that what – Collecting books is a bad thing. Right now, I think collecting books is an awesome thing. It's it's an honest, here's the amount of product we have out there. Here's a chance to build your library. Um, you might not be able to, to double your money, but the people who are buying books right now are are using these books as not only entertainment to read, but as a display item. They're proud to own them. And there's nothing wrong with that. And if I had the choice be, between being a book collector in 2005 and being a book collector in 2015, I'd, I'd choose 2015. Really? I would. Okay. Because I know going in, if I want the book, I want the book for the right reasons. Um, I want to put it on my shelf and I want to keep it. And I, personally, I'm, I'm going to pass down. I keep two Thunderstorm copies. I'm going to pass those down to my kids someday. And... I hope some of the collectors out there do the same. It's it's not, hey, this is worth 50 bucks or this is worth 100 bucks. It's like, hey, you know what? I collect books. That's kind of a rare thing in today's movies, video games, social media age. And, you know, it's something to pass on or if need be, it's something to cherish. Yeah, I, I do the same thing. I, I keep uh, copies of everything I've written for both of my sons. You know, when I'm gone, they each get one copy. Um, and then there are extras in case there are ever grandchildren or, you know, if they want to flip the extras to pay for my burial. Um, I don't care. I'm dead anyway. Um, but, yeah, I and, you know, I, I look at my collection. You know, I've, I've got a complete Midnight House collection, which you hooked me up with. I did. Um, you know, I've got an almost complete Arkham House collection. Now, you know, many of those... I could go on Kindle right now and get complete editions for free, you know, of the public domain stuff. But I like, I like having, in those cases, I like having those, those Arkham house editions, those midnight house editions. Cause those are, those are artifacts. They're not just books. They are, a, they are a time capsule to a, a, a period of history in this field, you know? So yeah, I agree with you on that. Now, uh, You've dabbled a little bit in ebooks, a little bit in trade paperback, but your your bread and butter is the limited editions. But you're also doing uh, the Storm Collector magazine. How did that come about? Um, Storm Collector magazine was initially an idea I had just to um, present my ideas of where I wanted to take Thunderstorm include stories from authors of upcoming books that I was going to publish. So for instance, I would put a short story by um, like Storm Collectors 2 had a short story by Ronald Kelly in it because I was going to publish Pitfall in the near future. So kind of my hope with that was people would pick up this magazine that was, I think, 10 bucks and maybe they would go after the limited um, when they saw the stories in them and they kind of connected the dots. Right. Um, truthfully, that's not how it turned out. Um, I might revamp it and do some other things with it, but it's one of those things where it was initially only a thunderstorm thing. It was pretty much storm collectors. It was for the collectors of thunderstorm. And so I don't know if it necessarily reached a wide audience. Right. And, Magazines are tough. I mean, magazines are tougher than books. I was going to ask. It's probably a loss leader for you. I it's mean, a loss leader. Yeah, I can't see it making. No, and, it was a loss leader. It was exactly right. It was like, hey, you know, you spend 10 bucks and a certain amount of people will go out and buy limited. So, And also, I wrote a column in it, which might be in another embarrassing moment. but um, And I've actually set up something on my webpage 
for people who are actively collecting thunderstorm items, it's called a Friday feature where I write a Friday column specifically about the ins and outs and what's coming up. And so they get a heads up of, hey, come June, he's going to come out with three books, not two or whatever. So they can kind of plan ahead. Um, and that was an extract basically of the magazine. But I haven't written it off yet. Um, I may still do some things with the magazine. There is a person who basically uh, has been a copy editor of mine for years now named John Foley. And um, we're going to be working together on this. And he was pretty much instrumental. And he did the interviews for the first couple issues. Um, so my plan is to have him really kind of take a take a lead on this and and uh, we'll see what happens. Cool. Um, what do you, I mean, what are you most proud of, of all the books you've published? I, I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot. If you're worried about slighting somebody, you don't have to answer, but what, that's a tough one. Uh, what am I most proud of? I mean, you can pick a couple if you want, but, um, cause you've published a lot of stuff. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, it's tough to go through, especially like you mentioned earlier that I have a wide range of things. And that was the other thing. If you go onto the Thunderstorm site, you're not going to see, horror publisher, dark fantasy publisher. There's no genre on the thing. You just kind of got to glance through the gallery and see yep. the different types of things I publish. And if you do that, you know, like I said before, you see a lot of, of new authors, something else I don't think you get enough credit for. And you should a lot of female authors. I think you right now, I think as far as small press limited edition goes, you're probably publishing more females than, Maybe Subterranean Press has you, but you're you're one of, definitely one of the leaders. I, you know, I've never and I've listened to every podcast up to this point. And and to tell you the truth, the audience, Brian and I had a conversation about this before we started the podcast. So this was kind of a a good question I wanted to be brought up. Um, when I listened to the podcast in order, the first female that you interviewed was Kelly Owen, right? And she basically spoke my mind on the idea of female authors. Yeah, my it's like, too. It was like, yeah, you're a female author. Okay. And I publish a lot of Kelly Owen. I publish a lot of Mary San Giovanni. Um, I've done Donna Lynch, Sarah, Sarah Pinbro. Um, but I couldn't tell you off the top of my head if I've ever done them in February. I really don't know yeah. what month I published them. Yeah. I have no clue. I think I that's just, commendable. I just got the manuscript, loved the work, or, and published it. Yeah. So I was all for what Kelly was saying on, what was that, episode three? Uh, episode two, I think. Episode two. On, yeah. Okay. And, no, you, no, you're right. It was three. You're, and I was like, man, she nailed it. And then comes along a couple episodes later, uh, this guy who basically called women hags. Rod Labby. And my thoughts were... Paul, are you really doing this right? Is it enough that you don't discern between the two? Am I supposed to be actively making sure that that I'm actively representing females correctly? But see, I think and you are without... I, I don't want to think about it. I, that, I just want to get a book in and say, I mean, this is a great book. If we're striving for true universal diversity, then we should be to the point where... you you don't even think about gender because it, it genuinely does not matter. And I think you are at that point. And I think, like I said, I think it's commendable. Um, yeah, I'll, I, give, I'll give you a, a little secret right now. This is an exclusive that you don't even know, and you're, uh, you're publishing it. This year's Maelstrom set will include five authors, five authors, uh, four of which are female. So, and, and none of none of which you've published before. See, to me, that's exciting. Yep. That's you know that's what I want to do. Now I'm not I'm not going to announce the names because obviously we haven't got to the contract stage yet. But yeah, all four of them are hard at work, and uh, I'm very this of all the the Maelstrom sets we've done, this is the one I'm most excited about. I'm just as excited. <laughs> I, I can't wait to see him. Can't wait to see the manuscript. So, so you can't think of, uh, of oh, any so, one. Oh, so sorry. We went well, back to the. That's all right. The uh, okay. We've been. I thought uh, 
I thought Nate Southard's Just Like Hell. I was worried about that book a little bit because I was worried about, wow, this is a huge impact. Agreed. And this is a book that, if you haven't read it, it's Dead Eye Press has a paperback. I think that ebook too, maybe. I don't I know. Think. But if you haven't read it, you have to go out and get it. Um, you can ignore the cover on it. It doesn't represent the book. I agree with that. Just buy the book, and it's it's a great read. Um, I was a I was very nervous over that book because of the subject matter. I was like, you know, there's this line, and where do you draw the line? And the reception it got, it was like kind of empowered me to say, you know, this is the stuff that I want to publish, and this is the subject matter that, you know, sometimes it's good to be have a serious subject matter. And I think that was one of my more serious books. There was an also recently a book called Open Wounds by Brandon Ford. And... And I, I, it's weird that my proudest books are the ones I struggle with so much during the publication process. But I struggled with this one, too. It was It's a very dark subject matter. It deals with sexual abuse. And it's one of those things where where do you draw the line? And is the author going too far? And it's, it's much in the vein of Ketchum's Girl Next Door. Right. And... I was severely depressed after I read that book. I was depressed. And I helped Brandon. We worked together on the ending. And it, uh, it's one of those books that you're not going to feel good after you read. But once it's once you've read it and you still think six months later, you're still thinking about the book, it's one of my prouder accomplishments because I think it touched on a subject matter that – it's important to talk about, and it's important to realize how we get to a point in society. A lot of people, you know, sexual abuse is a huge thing. Yes, it is. It's one out of three girls and one out of five boys. And I read that in high school. I read those statistics, and it's probably worse now. But a lot of people probably wonder, you know, how, how does that even happen? And that book kind of went through the stages of, a scenario that could happen to a young girl, and and it it was real to life, and so I was proud of that book. Um, there's other books I've been very proud of as well. Um, I know you were happy when you got to publish F. Paul Wilson. F. Paul he's one Wilson, of your favorites. Oh my gosh, that was just a F. Paul Wilson was like you told me about F. Paul Wilson um, when we contracted Mel's from Four, and I was just like. Wow, one of my heroes. I met him in World Horror 2011, but I met a lot of people, and I was just like a fanboy. Yeah. I mean, I was not a business professional. I was like, I'm this micropress guy, and you probably haven't heard of me. And, you know, I think I was handing out Mary's Thrall book, and he blurbed that. So I gave him a copy of that. I think I gave him a copy of, at that convention, but... Yeah, uh, that was a that it's, was an honor. And Tom hard. Monty Long as well. It's I got hard to... not to be a fanboy with Paul and Tom both. Now, and and you know, over the years they've both become dear dear friends. I mean, I, I think of them if not as father figures then as as uncles. I love them both. I've gotten in trouble with them both. Um I know that if I get in a jam, I can call them both for advice, but still Anytime I'm around them, and I'm around them quite often, there's still moments of, holy fuck, you know. Exactly. I just got shit face falling down drunk with Thomas Monteleone, or, you know, F. Paul Wilson just told me what he thought of my latest novel. It, it, it's impossible not to go fanboy with them, you know. Yeah, exactly. So what are you and doing, Todd? You're distracting us over there. Getting photos here. Todd's <laughs> taking his clothes Action off, photos. ladies and gentlemen. So and the, and the other the book that I'm proud of is, and they're all good, but Maelstrom One was kind of a turning point for me. It was it was a huge deal for Thunderstorm to be able to to do that and do that concept. Um, and Martin is my favorite character of yours, and Levi is my second favorite character of yours. And when you gave me Kelly Owen's Six Days, I was blown away. It's a great novel. 
And I was like, yes. man, is it wrong that I like Kelly's book the best out of the three? No, is that it's wrong? Not wrong. It's That's got to be wrong. Novel. That's just got to be wrong. But that three book set really kind of turned the page for Thunderstorm. I mean, it what it it allows me, like you've mentioned, going after younger writers, and it allows me to do take risks on on things that if. I had a bootstrap budget on every single book I did, it, those risks would be harder to take. So I've always been grateful for the opportunity to do Maelstrom sets. I, I think what I'm most impressed of everything you've done, I, I, I would say Just Like Hell by Nate Southern. Now, I haven't read Open Wounds by Brandon yet. It's on my pile at home. In fact, I think you may have just bumped it up my pile in that description. But uh, I remember when I read Just Like Hell, I... I told Nate, and you know, I'll repeat it to the audience, and this isn't verbatim, obviously, but I, I told him, I haven't had that visceral of an emotional reaction to a book since Jack Ketchum's The Girl Next Door. Now, people have heard me preach The Girl Next Door. Whether it's a book that you can handle reading or not, you cannot deny the impact it has had on this entire industry. And I think just like hell is the equivalent of that for this generation of horror writers. Um, I, it was, I think it's the best thing you've published. I I wish that everybody would read it. I agree with you. The Deadite cover, now I champion the Deadite covers for what they are. We, we, we've talked about that in earlier shows. But yes, in the case of Just Like Hell, I agree. I think it does a disservice to the book. It, and... Um, Dead Eye, I'm a huge fan of Dead Eye Press. Huge fan. Um, so, and I like their covers. It's the only cover I don't like of theirs, yeah. basically. And I don't know, I don't know why. And maybe it's my, a personal I, thing. I, maybe it's like I think it's because of that book. Yeah, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spoil the plot. But folks, really, you you need to read this. But the, it's. It's similar to, to The Girl Next Door. Um, there's a, the protagonist is a, a gay male teenager, and he's being bullied, and terrible, terrible things happen. Um, but I think with that Dead Eye cover, it's kind of tongue-in-cheek. It'd be perfect on like an Edward Lee novel or something by Rath James White, but when you see that cover, and then you know the story that's behind... You know, in the pages behind that cover, yeah, they just, they clash. They clash. Yeah, a little but bit. I love your edition of that book, you know. And you, But you know what I am thankful for is that, and this was announced in World War 2011. I'm thankful that Dead Eye came out for it, came out with that book. Because Thunderstorm's a limited edition guy. I had that thing sold out within a couple oh, months. Exactly. And that thing deserves a wider audience. And that's the other thing I wanted to, you know, discuss about publishing is I'm a sign limited guy but you know what if authors can go out and make millions of dollars or thousands of dollars or any money anywhere else more power to them they should be there should be ebooks just because I like sign limited editions personally and business wise doesn't mean that ebooks shouldn't be a thing that that we embrace that trade paperback shouldn't be a thing that we embrace and you know what dead I'd had the the ability to see that story for what it was and say, Hey, this is, this needs a wider audience. So I applaud him for that. Well, I agree. I agree. So is there anyone you haven't worked with or published yet that you're dying to? <laughs> wow. That, that list is, huge. I know I, I introduced that you. To, huge, that's a huge list. I introduced you to Jonathan Mayberry earlier. Yes, so you did. There might we, be something happening there, but I did. You introduced me to Jonathan Mayberry and I haven't read a lot from him. Uh, but I know he's very, very popular. Um, yeah, that list is huge. I mean, well, they're all listening right now. So I mean, I've I've been doing this eight years. Is it eight years? Seven years? Seven or eight years, something like that. And it feels like day one. The hell is that? I know the microphones are picking it up. That's our dumpster. It's a dumpster. It's a dumpster. <clears throat> Sounds like a fucking Balrog coming through the hotel. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. No, no, no problem. So, like, there's a – my next book coming out is a book called Slowly We Rot oh, by, by Brian, Brian, Smith. Brian Smith. Great. And book. I tell you, putting this one together felt like putting House to Blood together seven years ago. And 
So when I have that same joy and that same enthusiasm, I know I'm going to be doing this for the rest of my life. So, um, but for authors I haven't published, wow. I mean, one of the, one of the books that I would love to publish someday, and, and it's one of those fairy tale type things is Peter Straub's The Hellfire Club. It was, a. Uh, it was a book that I read in college when I was supposed to be going to class, and I just skipped my classes. I just skipped them. I just read that you thing. You skipped your classes for I Peter woke Straub. Up, caught the bo- I, I went to Arizona State University, woke up, brought that book along, stupidly, brought it along with my textbooks, rode up an hour ride, bus ride to ASU, went up to the library. I got an hour before class, opened up that book, and I just kept reading it, reading it, reading it. And I thought, well, I skipped this class, I skipped this class, I skipped this class, hopped back on the bus on the way home, read it on the way home, and it's like, wow, I spent an eight-hour day, and I didn't even have to leave my apartment, and I all I did was read this book. I, you know, I'm racking my brain. I don't think there is a limited edition of the Hellfire Club. There isn't a limited edition. If, if there was, I'd buy it. Peter, <laughs> I know you're listening. I know you're listening, dude. Give him a call. Give him an email. I'll, we'll put you guys in touch. Maybe something can happen. There. Man, you never know. The weirdest thing, that's the thats the funnest part of being at, like in the micropress or weirdest things pop up. And it's like you don't think it's going to come true when it does. I mean, it was the same thing with Mary San Giovanni's The Hollower. I read that in paperback. And I never thought I'd have a chance to publish that. And, then, you know, it had to be five years later. Yeah, about five, five years six later. years later, it came to be. And it was just like. One of those magical moments that it just comes to be, and it's it's things like that where you know that's the that's the real fun of of doing what I do. Is it still fun? Do you still enjoy it? I still love it. Yeah. Yeah, I still love. It. I can't imagine not doing it. Um, 2014 was a very very tough year on a personal level. Uh, Business wise, it it wasn't too bad, but. I was going through a lot of stuff last year and I thought about stopping. I really did. It was the, it was one of those things where it was just like, I really just thought about stopping and, and my wife, Janet really kind of convinced me that you're not going to want to do this. Um, and she was really supportive of think of how much fun you have. We'll get through these other things. And then, Things will be back to normal. And 2015 has just been a blast so far. Good. And in 2014, too, I really, really have to throw a shout out for Lee Hag and Kyle Liebeck and John Foley. Uh, Those guys, if you don't know, they're the 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 behind-the-scenes guys for Thunderstorm. They kept me alive in 2014 because my interaction was a little less. I was a little bit pulled back. And they kept the press going. So I really appreciated all they did when they stepped up. Good. Shout out to them. All right. Any final thoughts before we uh, head back down to the bar? No, I think I'm good. Any final questions? Uh, Not that. I I think we've covered them. We've filled them all. Awesome. All right, Dave, I'm going to throw this back to you in the studio. I'm sitting there with you through the miracle of time travel. And uh, we'll wrap this thing up. Before I do that, though, I do want to mention again that this interview was brought to you by Thomas Monteleone's Mafia. If you are a writer or a filmmaker or you are curious about the business, it's an absolute must read. It collects years and years of those historic columns full of just stories of the business and mistakes he's made and triumphs he's had. It's just fascinating, riveting reading. It's available right now on Kindle. First time in Kindle, finally. And uh, go check that out. Paul, thanks for coming in. Todd, thanks for uh, chasing away the Balrog there a couple minutes. Put your clothes back on. What the (laughs) fuck are you doing over there? Belching beaver. Belching beaver, ladies (laughs) and gentlemen. All right, Paul, thanks for coming in, man. This week's show is brought to you by the following. Pinky swears and double dog dares. Spit in your hand and shake. Tonight we ride. Hold tight, don't slide. That'd be your last mistake. Creposa Woods is a spooky dark place, even in the daytime. There are creepy crawlies and slithery slimies lurking behind every tree and under every rock, ready to reach out and snatch you away, never to be heard from again. 
Ghosts float in the misty fog that hangs in the air amid the branches. Some say serial killers and psychopaths bury their unsuspecting victims in shallow graves way far back from the cycle path that meanders through it, and the ghosts are all that remain. Are you scared yet, Frady Cats? Cool, then grab your bikes and let's go for the ride of your lives. Meanderings of a dark and lonely cycle path. Uh, or, um, psychopath. Randy D's third dark poetry collection can be found at all the normal book buying locations, and several copies are buried in the shallow grave way far back from the cycle path. That's if you're really dying to read it. Pick up your paperback copy or Kindle ebook copy and give this horror poem tome a good home. Horror fiction fans, brace yourselves for the double barrel horror volume two from Pint Bottle Press. The entire second series of chapbooks is now available in a single paperback anthology, as well as for your Kindle device. Six talented authors bring you 12 twisted tales for twice the nightmares. Edited by Matthew Weber, this pulse-pounding anthology includes two stories each from John Bowden, Simon Dewar, Patrick Freivald, Chad Lutsky, Karen Runge, and M.B. Vuchasek. Shane D. Keene of Shotgun Logic writes, like the dual blasts from a sawed-off shotgun, these 12 stories pack a brain-shedding wallop that kept me turning pages as fast as my fingers could tap the screen. Also available from Pint Bottle Press is the original Double Barrel Horror Collection, featuring six different authors, 12 hair-raising stories, and enough thrills and chills to choke a corpse. Pick up the Double Barrel Horror Anthologies at Amazon today. Only eleven ninety nine for paperback and two ninety nine for Kindle. And find more horror fiction at pintbottlepress.com. Okay, and we're recording this at World Horror Convention 2016 in Provo, Utah. Uh, joining me now is an author who has four Bram Stoker Awards, a Shirley Jackson Award, a World Horror Grandmaster Award. His books include Off Season, Off Spring, The Girl Next Door, Weed Species, Closing Time, and many, many more. Uh, his fans are, are numerous across all walks of life, including, <sighs> including Stephen Kosinowski, who's, who's hiding out here, geeking and watching, uh, history being made. <laughs> and, you know, also other people like Stephen King and Lady Gaga and Lucky McKee. Um, I am of course talking about Dallas Mayer, better known to folks in horror as Jack Ketchum. Welcome Dallas. Thank you, sir. It's good to have you here, man. This is, this is a long time coming. Yeah, when, uh, it's a lot of fun. When we started doing this podcast, you were on my short list of oh, yeah? people I had to interview. Okay. Um, we could spend two days doing this. I don't think two days is really No, I'm, I'm not going to do that I'd to be you. Tired. Yeah. Yep. So uh, we're just going to hit the, the Cliff Notes version of your life. Do it. <laughs> I want to start with uh, when you were a kid. You were, you were pretty much a loner as a kid. You weren't real social. Yeah, well, uh, I lived on a dead-end street, and it was uh, right after World War II, so everybody had uh, stuff that was built on the, on the uh, GI Bill. And so everybody had one, one or two kids except for me. Um, I, was the only, only, I was the only only child in my block. Yeah. And uh, I was really happy to be that way because I had a brook right behind me. I had a, a woods right behind me. I had another forest up, just up the street. Um and I liked that a lot. It was, you know, I was, I had trouble being a social kid right. early on. Um, and uh, it was kind of clicky there. Yeah. There was a lot of, one guy was a wonderful bully. I used to walk down the street with snakes in his mouth and shit like that. <laughs> um, so I stayed away from his ass. So that's where the part of the inspiration for Offspring came from then. Uh, yeah. yeah. yeah he's, in, he, he's actually in, uh, uh, very much in Go Next Door. Really? Yeah. In fact, I wrote all those kids into the girl next door. Yeah. Because I said it when I was growing up on that block. So if you want to know about my my youth, just read the girl next door. <laughs> <laughs> now, is it is it that way as an adult? Because I mean, I've known you twenty years now, and once I got the initial, oh my God, you're Jack Ketchum out of my system. Silly stuff. You're you're a you're a social guy amongst friends. I think, I think you know I got DNA, DNA handed me sort of an equal measure by my mom and my dad. Uh, my dad was very outgoing. We owned a store, a right. uh, confectionery store. And my dad was the front man because everybody liked my dad. And my dad was very, you know, hell fellow, well met kind of guy. Right. My mom was a total social outcast. She really hated to be social at all. She was a bookish person. Uh, she liked being by herself. Uh, when my parents finally divorced, 
she had suitors and she turned them all down. She wanted to be alone. She liked being alone a lot. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she so never remarried? Never remarried. No, and was happy not to. Yeah. So I think, you know, I got my dad's DNA and I liked doing the social thing a lot, but uh, I'm sure I still like being alone a lot. Yeah. And the, the one I've lived with, I've lived with since 1971. It's almost like living alone often. She's very quiet. She goes her own way and I go mine. It's yeah. great. And she probably. I mean, living together that long, she probably understands you need your alone Completely. time to work. Completely. When I'm working, utter silence, and she's great at it. Yeah. Yeah. Does is the cat great at that? Does the cat? You mean which of the five? Oh, which of the five? Yeah. <laughs> well, they're all great except around meal time. <laughs> then they surround the computer and sit on my lap and do all kinds of crazy shit to get me to wake up and feed their asses. Yeah. Uh, but no, they're great. You still and again, and again, cats are quiet. Yeah. You know, you can you can be with cats and don't even know they're there. Do you still write every day? No, only no. when I'm when I've got something on my mind to do. Yeah. Uh, if I'm doing a book or a or a uh, screenplay, then I write every day to keep the flow going. Right. Um, even if it's only a couple of paragraphs, I write every day. Yeah. Seven days a week. Uh, but if I'm not doing that, if I'm doing like short stories and things. I'm perfectly happy to take my retirement as it comes. See, you you have given me something new to aspire to now. What's that? Well, you know, when when I was younger, Are you a workaholic? when I was younger, I wanted to be you. But yeah, now now I want to be you where you are now where you don't have to write every day <laughs> well do you have to write every day are you free? i do i do are you i uh, trying to do that yeah it you know what the problem is i have not yet learned how to say no uh -huh. after 20 is no, a very fine word yeah i mean after 20 years if somebody wants to give me money i have a very hard time turning <laughs> that down and, and i overextend myself yeah. and uh, i was told once that the very first important thing the baby says is no and I think I learned that at a pretty early age. That's really good <laughs> advice. So, your dad's confectionery store. Yeah. He was selling paperbacks, magazines. Is that where you got your first reading material? Paperbacks, magazines. Uh, was a soda fountain, uh, drugstore. It was one of those places that don't exist really anymore. Yeah. Uh, we sold bread. We sold milk. We sold all kinds of stuff. So that's where you discovered horror. That's right. Well, that's no. I discovered horror in the movies and on television. Okay. But uh, but I, I remember the first time I saw a magazine called Famous Monsters of Filmland. I flipped. <laughs> uh, but I was in charge of the magazines and the books. Yeah. Because I was the reader, and I also had some sense of what kids were buying. Yeah. And we we serviced a lot of kids. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I, I, that was I became a librarian at a very early age so, at my father's store. So we're also I got to take anything I wanted home. I, I'm picturing little Jack Ketchum. <laughs> selling kids copies of Henry Miller's Tropic of Cancer and, and telling them where the good parts are. No, but I did steal my first copy of Tropic of Capricorn off my father's rack. Really? Yep. Yeah, Cap Capricorn came out before Cancer. Or, okay, that's I always get no Cancer the was the confused. first book. Okay, but Capricorn was actually published first, which is stupid. Really? But yeah, I remember taking that and going back by the brook and wrapping it in cellophane and reading it surreptitiously. <laughs> I couldn't take it home. <laughs> Loved it. Yeah, I must have been like twelve. Yeah, 18, something like that. I want to get back to that because later on you uh, you actually met Henry. Yeah, Miller. Miller keeps on popping up. In my yeah, life, it, cool. it seems to be a theme. Yeah. So you're yeah, eventually you started writing. Yeah. Um, I started writing when I was a kid. When you were a kid in your in your teen years, uh, Robert Block sort of adopted you as a, as, as a as a mentor. How did that come about? Well, um, I had a a twelfth grade no. Uh, I guess it was sophomore uh, English teacher. Right. And she said to the, our, their class, which is probably 30 strong, I want you all to write to some writer and see if you get a note back. So I wrote to Robert Block. I had just read Psycho and loved it. Right. So uh, I wrote to him, and everybody in the class got something back, which stunned the teacher and stunned all of us. Mostly it was postcards or a note. This guy sent me an entire letter. And so I showed my mom I was thrilled, and, and she said, well, you got to write back and thank him. So I said, sure. So I wrote back and I thanked him. And unbeknownst to me, my mom wrote back too. Yeah. And said, look, I got a troubled kid here. Uh, he thinks he wants to write. Would you encourage him? And so I guess Bob said he would do that. And so everything that I wrote from that point on, I sent to Bob. Bob critiqued it. This is like plays, essays, short stories, all kinds of stuff. And he was amazing. Uh, he did that until, well, until he died. Just like Lovecraft had done for him. He was I guess. doing for you. Yeah, yeah. And when my, when my mom died, he finally told me what, he, what she had done. She asked, she asked him not to, not to tell. Yeah. So he kept the secret. 
And it wasn't until she died that he he told me what she'd done. He was, you know, mom. <laughs> it's remarkable. We just had uh, Chet Williams <clears throat> on the show a couple weeks ago. Yeah. And he was talking about how Bob was so helpful and welcoming. He was a to, very good know, soul. And, and very funny soul, too. Yeah. You know, I I, th- I think of my own experience. You know, guys like me, Levin, Coop, Jesus, when we first were coming in. Yeah. You know, you and Chet, Dick Lehman, you guys were always so welcoming to us. Mm-hmm. Did that stem from Bob Block? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. You, when you get something like that, you got to give it back. Yeah. You know, and then later on, here comes Steve King giving me blurbs. Right. And writing the introduction to Girl Next Door unasked. Yeah. You know, he just said he, want, he wanted to do it and did it. You know, when that kind of big stuff happens, you got to try to, you got to try to give it back. Right. Mm-hmm. So, he, I guess... Bob Block was sort of your Jack Ketchum. He was sort of your Richard Lehman, in a way. In a way, I read everything he did. Yeah. Of course, I loved him. Uh, he was a great short story writer. Very, I mean, he's an underrated writer right. in general. Uh, but he's sort of just known as Psycho. But he wrote a lot of good stuff. He did. Yeah. He did. So now you started writing like for publication in the 70s. You were doing a lot of rock and roll magazines right. and, and stuff like that. Men's magazines, rock and roll magazines, women's magazines. I was an agent for three years before that for Scott Merritt Agency, which I call the Cosmo Demonic. Well, that was that was my question because which came first, age? I mean, I know you were writing all along, but yeah. did I was writing plays at that point when I got the job. So you and got I, the I was, job with the agency. I was producing little black box plays and you know off 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 Broadway. Right. And that's what I was doing at the time. And while you were with while you were an agent, uh, one of your clients became Henry Miller. That's right. How One of my that? clients was actually Bob Block too. No, yes, I never knew that. That was, that was a terrible. Yeah, he dumped his agent. He dumped his agent, and he came to Scott Meredith because Scott had a great reputation for making money. Right. And um, you know, there's Bob Block on my desk. I called him up and I said, "You, I'm your agent." <laughs> this is fucking ridiculous. How did he react? He loved it. Yeah. He loved it. Yeah. So I sold a couple of books for him. The, what? What's which books do you I remember? I don't remember. No. Well, he remember. had. He was so prolific. He yeah. had so many. Yeah. yeah. I believe I, I could be wrong, but uh, the that was it the second uh, sequel to Psycho. Psycho two. I think I yeah. sold that for him. No I, kidding. Yeah, yeah, and something Night that was in the title. I don't remember. There's a little bit of history. Now I like to think I know this genre's history, <laughs> Kazanowski. I'm looking at you, you know. What's it been about? You sold Psycho two. Yeah. How about that? Jesus. So Henry Miller, you you meet him. Do you, do you tell him that you stole his book when you were a kid? Well, it was, there was more to it than that. I was reading him a lot. And uh, I, I did my first good writing uh, in a, on top of a mountain in New Hampshire. Yeah. Very close to the edge of the White Mountains. All alone in a cabin, basically. A hundred, hundred-year-old cabin. Do you remember what you were writing at the time? Yeah, I was writing my first, quote, novel, which sucked. Not off-season? No, I threw that, that got thrown in the garbage. Okay. The first novel got thrown in the garbage. And I was writing a children's book. Um, and that I still have. And the fact that got me my first agent, uh, she tried to sell it, couldn't. But um, uh, so I was writing that stuff, and I was still writing plays. But I, I heard somehow through the grapevine that Miller was dying. So I sent him a letter, basically saying, "Please don't die." <laughs> <laughs> and can I come to see you? And I got a postcard back from him in his handwriting, saying, "Thank you very much, um, but um, I'm not seeing anybody right now. But uh, I'm okay." Right. I still have the postcard. Wow. Yeah. So there's another connection there, me writing that. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, and I think my midway through my second year as an agent, he was looking for a new agent. Went to Scott again because Scott was money, money. Right. Not a very nice man, but he made a lot of money. I've heard that. He was a, he was a bitch. <laughs> he was a bitch. Yeah. When he died, I just smiled. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I mean, you know, but I gotta say I, I learned a shitload in that in that business. It was great. Yeah. Um, anyway, back to, up to Miller. Um, he came across my desk. We were alphabetized, right? Because I had the ends, and uh, he brought me in to, in to talk about it. And I and he said, Yeah, I don't really think I want him. He's old. He's past his prime. He's not making any money. I said, Scott, it's Henry Miller. You can put him in all your literature, all your promotion stuff. It's Henry Miller. You can put him up there with Norman Mailer and Arthur C. Clarke and all those big guys that you got. Well, it's Miller. He said, all right. 
but you take care of him. Uh, if it's a problem that you, you know, if he's, because he's probably cranky because he's old. Um, I said, look, I'll phone him from my own house. You know, it's, you got to take Miller. I want him. Right. All right. And I took him. And then uh, we talked. He turned out to be no problem at all. He had a wonderful secretary named Connie. And Connie was just really on the money. Um, and so he was an easy client. Yeah. When he did talk. He wasn't cranky. He was just looking for, you know, cash. Right. And I resold um, his Colossus of Marusi. Pretty good piece of money. I sold a couple pieces to Playboy. Um, so we did okay by him. And then when I got sick of that fucking job, um, and I said, I've got to quit. The reason I, I realized I had to quit was I pushed an old lady in, in, in the rain out in the way of a cab to get it. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah, it was pouring rain one day. I had books under my arm, take home and read. And there were no cabs and no cabs, and I'm getting soaked. And uh, no umbrella. And I reached for a, a, a cab door, and this woman reached for it at the same time, and I pushed her away. I don't know, what the shit did I just do? Sort of like Stroop in the... the yeah. Your character, the collected yeah. and broken on the wheel of sex. I know, yeah, I'd become Stroop. But, um, so anyway, I said, I'm sorry, really, really, take the cab. She said, no, 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 no. And it's raining on both of us. She's just, you know, got a bush gun on it. Right. Uh, I said, okay, we'll share it. So we got in the cab together, and I think I, I yeah, I got off first. But through the entire cab ride, I said, look, I'm really sorry. I'm not usually like this. And she said, uh-huh, <laughs> uh-huh. And I said, please, you know, I'm, I, you know, uh-huh. She gave me no quarter whatsoever. <laughs> so, so when I went home and I told Paul this story, I said, I've got to quit this job. And she said, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. But the one thing I wanted to do before I did that was go out and see Henry. Right. And I had an excuse because we had a small contract with, um, uh, what was his press at that time? He had a small press uh, working for him. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of it now. It's escaping me. Um, but uh, that was the excuse to go out and meet him and, and have him sign the contract. Right. Capra Press, that was what it was. Okay. They published a lot of good people, small numbers. Uh, they published Lawrence Durrell and um, Anais Nin, uh, people in that area. Right. right. Um, so I got on a plane, my own my own ticket, paid for the whole thing, and went up to to uh, meet him one day at Ocampo Drive in uh, California. Yeah. And we had a fabulous time. Was that a was that a? Uh, I'm I'm blanking out on the phrase. I'm I'm thinking. I'll admit to you, Kosnowski. It just it just hit me that I'm sitting here interviewing Jack Ketchum. Yeah. I've known the man twenty years, but I'm reverting to fanboy. Was that a water Was that a watershed moment for you? Like it was stunning. Yeah. Uh, Connie uh, opened the door. His secretary. Connie's secretary, who I'd been in touch with quite a lot and was very efficient, turned out to be this goddamn playboy bunny. She was gorgeous. <laughs> she was this blonde, gorgeous woman, but very smart, very cool. And she ushered me into his bedroom, and, and she said, you know, he's sleeping, but he won't. But I said, well, you know, let him sleep. I've got all the time in the world. She said, no, no, he wants to see you. So she walked in, touched him on the bed, and just he hit his shoulder, and he was bang, he was up and cooking. Hi, Dallas, how you doing? It's great to see you. Da, da, da. Wow. And he was wide awake and, and cooking. So we must have talked for an hour and a half. I had brought a couple of books, and I said, you know, sign the one you want. Right. He signed them all. Um, and he handed me a, a, a group of postcards, uh, watercolors that he had done, and he signed some of those. And um, we talked about... Oh, we talked about the money. We talked about Scott Meredith. Right. Uh, he said, I, I went to Scott Meredith because I heard he was a good pirate. <laughs> so I said, that's pretty good. That's pretty descriptive. <laughs> um, but we talked about the old days. We talked about Lord, uh, Durrell and Nina. We talked about how I, I I was able to confess what he meant to me over the years. Right. Which was fabulous. Um, and, um, and then he finally said, look, I'm really tired. I've got to go back to bed. It was wonderful to do this. And uh, I thought I'd met a really... Big, big soul. Little man. Big yeah. Soul. So he said to Condi, look, uh, make sure you show him the wall before he leaves. So, fine. And there's a big blank wall just off the kitchen. And it's an autograph wall. And there's Dural and there's uh, Picasso and there's Nin and all these people who had signed this. Holy shit. Isn't that, yeah, isn't that amazing? And I said to Connie, um, it must be great to work for this guy. And she said, He's the best man I've ever met. Wow. I just went, oh, Jesus. <laughs> I remember driving down the highway 
um, from because it was up used in the Pacific Palisades, which is quite elevated. Uh, driving down the highway, just crying and smiling, and I knew I was going to quit that job and write. Yeah, that was the moment you knew. Yeah. 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 Bob Block and Henry Miller. Fuck that, yeah. yeah. Jesus Christ, yeah, dude. I, I mean, that right I there, that, that's a life right there. It is. Yeah. You know, if you hadn't done anything else after that, I mean. I owed it to them to do it. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And you did. Um, you know, as we said, you started writing for the men's magazines, the rock journals. Uh, back Anybody then, would have me. Yeah, yeah. back then your suit was. I, I did classic decorations and home crafts, man. Did you really? <laughs> yes. Now, do you still have like copies of all that stuff? I've all got the articles sheets on all of it. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I, that's what I always wanted. Your pseudonym back then was Jersey Livingston. Uh, it was one of them. One of them. When I was writing for the men's magazines, at one point, I don't remember which magazine, I did five stories for them. Yeah. You know, in one issue, so I wrote with my own name. Uh, I wrote with Jersey Livingston and three others. Bruce Arthur was one of them. You actually wrote <laughs> under Dallas Mayor. Yeah. I see. Now, that I did not know. Yeah, I did. Yeah? Yeah. So, I know, you know, Broken on the Wheel of Sex collects all the Jersey Living. Have you ever thought of going through, like, all the Rock Magazine articles and stuff and seeing if there's anything in there you could collect? No. No? <laughs> <laughs> I guess I consider that juvenile, yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah. See, I gotta tell you, it was, what was cool about it was you learned your craft as you're going and got paid for it. I'll it was, tell you, there was a, nothing. There's nothing like that that exists today. As a fanboy, you know, if you did like a limited edition through Cemetery Dance, I'd be all over that. I'll and I know that. it's juvenilia, but <laughs> it's fascinating I'll give to me. Some thought. All right. I guarantee you, the listeners are going to be emailing me this week saying the same thing. All right, you tell me if they do. All right, I will. Okay. There we go. We have your word. Okay. Kazanowski, you're a witness. Did it? 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 Did Eventually, like I said, this is the Cliff Notes version. I could interview this man for two days, but uh, eventually, you tackle your first publishable novel. Yeah. Which was off season. Right. Um, everything had been building to that point. Uh, did you question yourself when you're writing it? Did you say, "This is too graphic. This is too extreme. This is too over the," you know? I knew exactly what I wanted. I wanted a book. That was doing what the movies were doing at that point, and the books weren't. Right. And that was shoving the violence in your face, blood splatter in your face. It was Night of the Living Dead, uh, um, a Texas Chainsaw. Spit on your grave. Yeah, all those. Yeah, all those. Um, and and nobody was doing exactly that in books. They were cutting away. Right. Even King was cutting away. Um, and I said, I'm not going to cut away. So I did it gleefully. I was having a ball. Yeah. I had uh, advice from a pediatrician. <laughs> <laughs> he was a retired pediatrician. Uh, it was uh, Paula's uh, stepfather at the time, and um, I said, "So you know, if I if I stab a guy here, the blood spatter is going to go where?" And he said, "I don't know. I'm a baby doctor, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll look it up." So he did. He did all my research for me. It was amazing. Wow. Yeah, and he had a ball doing it. He was having a blast. Yeah. So yeah, it, I did it really with a lot of pleasure and glee. Was it Was it hard to sell? Because of that? No, it was easy to sell because uh, I was still known in some circles as an agent. Right. Uh, so what I did was I invented this guy, Jack Ketchum. I was com comfortable with pseudonyms by then. Right. And I said, look, I found this guy, Jack Ketchum. I sent it to uh, Ballantine Books, uh, Judalyn Del Rey there. And I said, I found this guy. He's really great. You know, so like, you presented it as Jack as, Ketchum's as an agent. agent? As an agent. Oh, yeah. that's fucking brilliant. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so... <laughs> So she said, great, we can buy it. That's terrific. I really like it. And I said, well, Judy Lynn, it's really me. <laughs> I said, yeah, that's even better. We can make the deal because you know how to read a contract. Right. So uh, that's what we did. You know. And then, I, then it went to Mark Jaffe, who was the head of, uh, of it then. Uh, he was uh, just off Random House. And uh, at Random House at the time owned Ballantyne. And he said, he sat me down. I said, kid, this could make me a fortune. Nobody's ever seen a book like this. Nobody's ever seen a book with teeth like this. But he was right about that. Well, it didn't make me a fortune. <laughs> it didn't make me a fortune at all because, in fact, it almost sunk me. Yeah. Um, they did a wonderful, uh, had wonderful plans for promotion. They had uh, port and purchase displays. They had banners, all this stuff. And they did a 20,000 copy edition uh, just for distributors with art and the whole bit. That was big. That was very big. Yeah. Very unusual. And they got back feedback from their distributors that this is violent pornography. We, pornography. We want nothing to do with it. Violent pornography. Yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> the book that 
uh, they were going to uh, promote like hell became an embarrassment. And so they pulled all the point of purchase and they pulled all the banners and uh, and they, they had planned an edition of I think 200,000 copies. They released 100,000 copies and they sold out completely. Yeah. Uh, but by that time, I wasn't embarrassed. Man. I, you know, I went from being the golden boy, you know, to shunning the kid when he walked in the door. And that's kind of what happened to me at Random House in the it? terminal when when Walmart balked and said this will offend our Christian yeah. customer base. You yeah. know, they they wanted nothing more to do with me after Fuck that. Fuck you, Christian customer base. <laughs> yeah. But it, you know, it it made my career because. Um, uh, it, it did sell out, and it sold out, I guess, to the people who counted. Because I remember going to the first car convention with Edward Lee, first one I'd ever gone to. Don't remember which one it was. Um, but uh, suddenly everybody knew me. Yeah. And that was because of off season. Wow. Uh, and so I, it, well, to go on from there, I, they published, Valentine published one other book called Hide and Seek. Yeah. Which they sort of just put an easy cover on and released, I think, 40,000 copies. Yeah, they didn't really do much for Hide and Seek. Yeah. I, I know as a teenager back then, looking for your stuff, I found you with Girl Next Door. Yeah. And then it was, okay, I got to find everything else this guy has done. Hide and Seek was the one I could never find. Yeah, that was hard to find yeah. for a long time. Back in print now. So. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. You were you, you mentioned you and Lee. You know, Lee was doing something very similar with his stuff, and, and you were doing it. And, you know, out in California, Dick Lehman, you, you guys well, all... Well, our only real similarity, it's interesting, because the only real similarity is that we went over the top of our Well, that's that's my point. Because, I mean, Lee had, had this wonderful sense of humor, yep. and, and he researched like hell, which yep. I never did. Um, and there were some very erudite things in Lee's writing, yep. which is hard to admire. And Dick Lehman was just writing his, you know, comic books, basically. Yeah, exactly. So, you see comic books. Yeah. Yep. So we weren't really alike. Our styles weren't alike at all. Stylistically, night and day. Yeah. And yet, all you know, as as a okay. teenager, as a teenager who was reading that stuff. Yeah, you looked for it. You, you were kindred. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it was. And did you, I bet you also got into uh, the James Herbert books. Absolutely. Like the rats books. Absolutely. The yeah. rats, the whole rat series, sure. the dark. Sure. You know. Don't get me wrong. I loved King. Yeah. I loved Koontz. Yeah, but you guys, and and a little later on, the Splatterpunks. Right. Um, you know, it was like, okay, this is what I want to do. I can do this. You know, yeah. it, with 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 Steve and Koontz, it was this is what I enjoy reading. Mm -hmm. With you guys, it was this is what I want to fucking gotcha. do. So let's get the girl next door because. Uh, I think now with that one, that was the first one that you you based off of a real life case. Am I correct or am I wrong? Well, yeah, um, if, unless you count off season, which is sort of based on the Sonny Bean story, you know. Right. Yeah, but that's Sonny Bean may, may never have even existed. Right. Uh, he was, he's mentioned in Newgate Calendar as a real guy, but right. I don't know. But this one, you yeah, what that was closely based. What on made that. you decide? Hey, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna fictionalize this. I had read about the case in uh, uh, J. Robert Nash's Blood Letters and Bad Men, which is a really great anthology of American crime. Right. And uh, her photo was, uh, Gertrude Banaszewski's photo was in there, the one who orchestrated right. this crime. Uh, and I was fascinated by her. I thought and her, her face was just haunting. Uh, and so I thought about it for a moment. There were all sorts of great themes in this particular crime because it was a case of violence of a woman against a woman, which is kind of rare. Right. Um, and then there was bringing all the kids in, which is Lord of the Flies shit, uh, and uh, or the neighborhood, the larger neighborhood being involved. Uh, there, there, and then the fact that um, Meg, my Meg, um, took all this violence and all this abuse to save her sister from, do, from getting it. Right. So there was a heroic element to it. Uh, and I just thought there was an awful lot going on in the secrets, you know, hidden, hidden things that were going on that, that a select group of children basically knew about, but the adult world didn't. Right. Um, and I knew I wanted to write about it, but I thought initially I was going to maybe go to Indianapolis where it actually occurred and write a true crime book. But I didn't want to go to Indianapolis <laughs> because I knew nothing about Indianapolis. And so I put it off and put it off and put it off. But it was in the back of my brain. And when my mom died, I had to go home. Uh, over the course of several months, just settle her affairs, sell the house. It was the place I grew up in. Right. It was that dead end street. And were the I, woods still there? The and woods everything? were still there. The brook was still there. Yeah. So and the isolation, although they they um, they had actually uh, 
broken into uh, the streets. So it wasn't a dead end anymore. Um, the sense of isolation was still there, and I remembered it. it was like a memory play. So I did no research on this book at all. I just remembered what it was like and what the kids were like and what the adults were like at that time and placed the crime there. Wow. Yeah, it's easy to write in a weird way. Now, I'm curious, as a writer, you know, you, you did that. Uh, weed species, again, mm -hmm. based on, on mm -hmm. real life. When we write, we, we <clears throat> go to dark places. Yeah. Um, in a case like this, where it's, you know, it's based on something that happened in real life, which I, I guess maybe I kind of tackled that in Ghoul. It was autobiographical. You know, both of my best friends were came from abusive households. Um, but for something like this, is it easier to do that, or is, do you go to an even darker place when you're basing it off of that? Well, you, I think you, you need to be really responsible to the victims. Yeah. That's what you really, really need to know about. Uh, and you're going to trace this fairly closely to the real crimes. Right. Uh, that's the most important thing is to not exploit the crime. Right. Um, and so it was a, a fine line to walk with that because it could have turned into pornography pretty easily. It could have. Uh, but it didn't. And that's because I knew when to pull back. And I also employed a, uh, a kind of a gimmick. Um, the main character is the kid next door. Right. So he doesn't see everything. He hears a lot. He's, he's, he sees just enough to make him culpable, um, but not really, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, he didn't really actually involve he's, himself. Right, he's not active in it. Yeah. Uh, so that allowed me to pull back at, at, at times, since you know, he didn't see that, he just heard about it. Right. And uh, so it, I think it didn't hit the pornographic bucket. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know now you and I have talked, you know, in, in private, uh, you were not a fan of the the paperback original cover uh, with the Jesus skeleton Christ. cheerleader. Uh, I told you, you know, I was I was a teenager <laughs> and yeah, I saw that you know? <laughs> I saw that cover on the newsstand and hey, or no, it was Bookland. I saw it at Bookland and it was like, hey, here's a book for me. This is something I'll somebody, enjoy. Somebody told me that he put he was a, a bookseller put on put it with the R. L. Stein books. Well, you I, know, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, what if some dad said, oh, what are you reading, kid? <laughs> Hello, come back with a shot and kind of blow the books out of our way. But despite all that, Dallas, and I think you know this, I think you understand just what a seminal impact that I novel had. Um, you know, I, I always use the example, Nikon, many years ago, uh, Saturday night, Joe Hill, Mary San Giovanni, and myself were just sitting over a quiet corner talking. And we were discussing, all three of us, the impact that the girl next door and Lansdale's The Drive-In had had on us uh, yeah, as, as teenagers. Yeah. And we looked up and we noticed there's a, a crowd of younger writers gathered around us taking notes. Ha! Huh, really? um, I mean, when you look back now, That's hilarious. You've, had, you've had one hell of a career. Yeah. But when you look at The Girl Next Door, it, I mean, that inspired an entire generation of writers. That's, <clears throat> that's, that's, that's got to feel really fucking good, right? You know, I'm not really aware of that. I mean, you're telling me it's going on. It is. It trust me, it's going on. <laughs> that I am very. Uh, you know, Chad Gonzalez. You know, myself, Carlton Mellick, Leben, Jonathan Mayberry. You know, we, Joe Hill. We we all read that book at a certain really? point in our yeah, lives, yeah. and it was like, bam. Yeah. You know. That's very. That makes me very happy. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad. <laughs> um, you know, you've had five film adapt adaptations, I think. Yeah. Uh, the girl next door was one of them. Now. That caused some controversy uh, when it premiered at Sundance. Mm -hmm. uh, there's video footage on YouTube of, of a guy just having a meltdown yeah. over the emotional contact. A lot of people think it was staged. <clears throat> I know it wasn't staged. I know the producer. You want to set the record straight on that? Sure. What happened was um, this guy, toward, at, at the end of the film, stu yeah, stood up. I was there, but he stood up and he started screaming, I guess, about how he hated the thing. How dare Sundance, of all places put this in his face. This, this terrible pornography. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they ushered him out, um, and I guess he went out fairly quietly, uh, but he, we could still hear him, they could still hear him outside. And so Lucky, the, the director, was supposed to do a Q&A, and the producer, uh, Andrew Van Den Houten, had a, a, a photographer there, a cinematographer there, ready to shoot that. Right. And he said basically, hey, forget the Q&A, go out there and follow him. That's smart. So he did, and the guy went on for like a half an hour. It was, you know, just 
Yeah, he's just ranting and raving. Well, and he realized he had a camera on him. He had he an did, audience he now. Did, no, he, oh, he, no, he, he didn't, didn't know that? No. no, if you look at the, the, the footage, he's not aware of that at all. I guess the guy with the camera was holding it around waist high. Yeah. And that's what he shot. Oh, no so shit. The guy never had any notion that he was being filmed. Wow, that makes it even better. Yeah. Have you have you ever seen that, Steve? Uh, no. You got to go on YouTube. You, you can and, see it on YouTube. It's pretty funny. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's hilarious. Yeah. Um, he's so sincere, and the fact is, he's articulate, which makes it even more fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, and his reaction basically was my mother's reaction when she picked up Girl Next Door in my bedroom and was flipping through it. And, you know, what are you reading now? So. <laughs> I'm reading this trash, Mom. <laughs> so you, you brought up Lucky. Let's talk about Lucky. Um, All right. You, you haven't done a lot of collaborations in your life. Um, you've done some things with, with Ed Lee. Yeah, we did um, short stories. Yeah, short stories. Um, and one with Petey Kasich. And one with Trish Kasich. Yeah. And how did, how did it come about with Lucky? I guess he adapted the movie first and then... Well, Lucky uh, optioned... Um, uh, read for himself to direct, right? And he optioned uh, the Lost for his buddy uh, um, Chris Sivertson, right? Direct. And so we knew one another from that, and we, you know, we had good conversations about him, and I, you know, I kind of liked him. But the way I fa- we fa- I found him was kind of on. Um, I just got back from a convention, and it was a film convention, so I had a mass of uh, DVDs in my hand, right? I, I think I must have had at least a dozen. And I went going through them, and they were all amateur bullshit. They were, I, I think I watched six, and I said, oh, fuck this, put them away. They were all Mike Lombardo films, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> real they, they were total junk. And then you found... You know, well, then at the same time, uh, while I was away, I'd gotten this thing in the mail from uh, my agent from this guy, Lucky. I said, his name is Lucky? Fuck this. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so I put that with the other shit. And then being the dutiful guy I am, I went through them at some point, like maybe a, a week or two later. Right. And I saw May. And I went, what the fuck? Whoa. May blew me away. Holy hell yeah. So I called my guy. I said, get in touch with this guy fast. And so that's when we started talking about um, uh, his uh, option in the two pieces. Yeah. yeah. I want to come back to Lucky, but something you, you said just jiggered my memory. I, I've always found it fascinating. You were an agent. Yeah. And I've, I'm working on a memoir. It's basically for my boys. I don't know if I'll ever publish it, but uh, you know, there's a whole chapter about. You're gonna publish it. I'm a published whore. I am a published whore. I'm just a whore. But um, <laughs> you know, there's a whole chapter about. I'm, I'm at a World Horror Convention in 2003, and Don Daria brings me a contract for The Rising, and I think I, I maybe I've told you this story off, you know, off on the side, Stephen, but. You know, I'm like, fuck, I got to get an agent. And I've got the contract in my hand. He just handed it to me. And I walk into the hotel bar. And there's Dallas. It's like 2 in the afternoon. Nobody else in the bar. And he's <laughs> like, hey, Brian, how you doing? This. I'm like, good. Uh, I'm like, I, I just got a contract from Don Daria. And he says, really? Buy me some doers. Or makers, Mark. No, it was doers. It was doers. I'm like, okay. He pulls out a pen. Dallas pulls out a pen. And he starts writing on my contract. I'm like, what, what, what are you doing? He's scratch like, this, scratch he, this. Scratch he's like, I used to be an agent. Trust me. Scratch this. No, you can get more than that. Yeah, this is fair. No, that's absolutely bullshit. He negotiates my contract for me. He hands it back to me. He says, do this with every contract you ever get. I still have that contract at home, and I still – most of it I have memorized. It's your template by now? Yeah, it is. It is my template. Um I forget where I was going with this. Oh, I remember. Um, I, never got, I, I never got a fee for this, you know. I bought you doors. <laughs> that was you. What I've always found fascinating is you have the ability to do that, and yet you still use an agent. Oh, yeah. Uh, I told Alice once if she retires, I quit. Yeah? Yeah. We're, we're best friends at that by now. She, I've been with her for 27 years. So that's why? Uh, no. But also, she's, it's a very practical thing to do. She has wonderful contracts abroad. Right. Um, I've been published very well in Germany, in France, in uh, Italy, in uh, in uh, Japan. Right. Um, and in various other countries, China, you know, uh, Korea. Right. I couldn't do that without her because she's got all the sub agents and stuff. Uh, so I I want her for that, and I don't want her for reading contracts. I don't expect we don't really even need, need to do that. But she um, vets the deal, vets the person who's dealing with the deal. Oh, that's so nice to have. Yeah. You know, um, and so we'll talk about, you know, is this worth it? How, how you know, 
how do you want to approach this particular guy? Right. Um, do you really want to do it? Um, and so we, we, you know, we have these chats. Yeah. And it's well worth it. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, now swing back around to Lucky. Now you guys have done two collaborations with a third forthcoming, correct? I think we did the woman we did on Not Sam. Uh, and yeah, we this you got a new one coming. Yeah, Secret Life of Souls, it's called. Is he sort of your muse now? I mean, it's, <laughs> it, I mean, from an outsider's perspective, it seems like you guys really work well together. We work really well together. Um, he could be my my grandson, I think, at this point. He's pretty <laughs> he's pretty young, but he's awfully accomplished and smart. He knows all of this stuff. Yeah. And uh, we're we have very similar tastes, and we're on the same page for everything. We've never had a real disagreement. Yeah. In all this time. And that's pretty cool. Cool. Um, so yeah, I'd work with him again. We're yeah. talking about doing another screenplay. Yeah, yeah. He's a sweet guy. I've only met him Very once, sweet but sweet guy. I met him. Uh, Don't get him pissed off though. He's got a temper. That's what I've heard. Yeah. I'm not going to reveal my sources, no. but that's what I've heard. No, but but, uh, but you, you know, you, you've got to push him pretty hard. I met him in a con. He was he was a sweet guy he's to me. Nice so. Guy. Yeah. yeah. So you know, someone else that's a fan of yours, Steve King, of course. Yeah. Um, you know, I always think back to, you know, his, I don't want to call it a rant, I want to call it a schooling, when he, he basically told the literati, you know, you people are full of shit, oh, you should be reading Jack Ketchum. Yeah, that was at the... What uh, was that, that like? It was the, was the, the, the uh, uh, book... Uh, the... Hello. I know what it is too. I'm blank. Yeah. I should I should point out to the home audience. Uh, Dallas and I are, are well into a bottle of Knob <laughs> Creek. Uh, you know, before we start. In fact, speaking of Stephen, can you can you give me a refresher? And I guess I will. Too. And Dallas, take one too. Rocks for each of us, and, and a little water, bit of water for him. Water. So. Uh, National Book Awards. There it uh, is. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Oh, he was wonderful. I'm I'm sitting there at the table with Paula. And with Steve and uh, 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 Peter Straub and his wife, uh, and with um, Evan Hunter. Right. And Stephen is doing this wonderful fuck you to the National Book Awards, you know, <laughs> but in a very gentlemanly way. He was, you know, he was he was taking him to task, but he wasn't really offensive at all. And at one point he said, "And uh, here's this guy, uh, Peter Straub. He's possibly written one of the best books of his life. It's Lost Boy, Lost Girl." Right. And then sitting next to him is is uh, Dallas Mayer. He reads his Jack Ketchum. Uh, his his uh, uh, he, he said something to the effect of between um, something to the effect that uh, Clive Barker and I had changed the course of popular yeah. fiction. <laughs> oh yeah. And you know he's all these raving letters, and Straub and I are looking at one of like. With mouths wide open. Because you and Peter like, had why? no idea he was no going to get there to do that, right? No idea. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And he, he, have you read him? Have you read him? <laughs> <laughs> I remember reading the transcript online and That's literally right. standing up out of my desk chair and, and clapping. Cheer, doesn't yeah, it? I clapped. I'm yeah. like, fuck yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. And again, he offended no one, but he no. just he just took him to task. But what was that like sitting there and hearing that? Oh, it was a thrill, man. Yeah. It was a total thrill. Yeah. And, you know, it's really one of those wide open mouth moments. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And Peter was the same. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that was incredible. Yeah. Now, another famous fan. Let's, let's pause and take a drink. All right. Stephen, fill in for us. Uh, so 15% of the rising, that'd be like negative $30,000. Negative $30,000, yeah. <laughs> okay. No, I bought him doers. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> The Rising has done very well for me over the years. That that's all the public needs to know. Yep. I wish my other books would do as well, but people seem to like their zombies. But, all right. So uh, another another we we maybe you don't want to talk about this, and if you don't, tell me, and I'll shut it down. But but we have to we have to mention your connection to Lady Gaga. Are we allowed to talk about sure. that? Yeah. How, how how did you meet her? I know, but the listening audience doesn't. Um. One, I was looking for, I guess, a new bar at some point, and uh, because the one I, I keep on keep on shutting bars down in New York. I think the Angel of Death for bars. <laughs> Jack Ketchum, he yeah, shuts down the, bars. Angel of Death and bars. Um, <laughs> but that's not my fault. That's the bar's fault. Uh, anyhow, I, I walked in this bar one day, and there's this guy sitting there drinking, a very congenial guy, and we got we just got to talking, and it was Joe Germanata, and it turns out that was uh, Stephanie Germanata's dad. Right. Um, and we hit it off real well. And so uh, there was a whole crowd of us 
looking for a new barn. We also turned we went to this one. It's also closed by now. Um, Not the Aegean. The Aegean, yeah. Oh, it's closed. No, it's gone for years, my friend. Come to New York. Uh, <laughs> I I drank there with you. <clears throat> you did. Mary and I met you there one one yeah, time. Yeah. yeah. It was the Aegean, but. Um, when that happened, it, it, I think Stephanie was about, oh, she was high school. Yeah. She was probably 15 years old. And I got to know her whole, Joe's whole family. Uh, they're a very tight family. And so you get to know one, you get to know them all. Right. And I remember at some point, I mean, I was charmed by them all. Even uh, the younger sister, uh, who's, I think, like, I don't know, nine or 10 or, or something. Um, but Stephanie started actually showing me. Yeah, because I'm the writer. Right. And, and she'll say, hey, this is writer. Let him look at your stuff. So I looked at some of the return papers and things when she was high school, in high school. Yeah. And shortly thereafter, she started doing piano bars. Uh, I don't know if she could even drink at the time. She was playing piano in piano bars. No kidding. And she was fabulous. She was. She went through like a Billy Joel phase. She went through an Elton John phase. She went through a phase where all of her chords were Beatles uh, Beatles chords. Well, you can see that reflected in her you music. You can. You certainly yeah. can. Uh, but she wrote a lot of stuff that I still think she could re-record at some point. She was doing a lot of ballads then, yeah. And it's really great to see her do the ballads. But she always had a fabulous voice. Yeah. Uh, this really, I, I'm cursed with with um, perfect pitch. I used to be a singer myself. Yeah. And I can hear the slightest off note. She's never off pitch. She's just like bang right on. She gets everything. So did you did you serve as like her her English tutor? Nah. No, no, I just, just, I just more yeah, you just, look at it and give yeah. it. And then, I, then I, I, uh, myself and a bunch of us just to go down to watch her perform. Yeah. And so I became a fan way before she was Gaga. And I remember um, that when she went to Europe and she came back and I remember Joe sitting in the bar and he's shaking his head. He's going, oh my God, oh my God. I said, what? He said, she wants to call herself Lady Gaga. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Joe, whatever she wants, just go for it. See what happens. Yeah. And of course, the rest is history. We saw what happened. <laughs> yeah. um, you you got to see her when she played Madison Square Garden. I did. And your your seatmate I'm, was was it Paul McCartney? No, no, no. no they were in the same section. They were in the same yeah. section as you. Yeah. And um, when Paul McCartney came in, he stood up and he got a big line, a big round of applause, and some model came in. And she got a big round of applause. So I just stood up. <laughs> and I got a big round of applause. So, <laughs> so, so picture that. Cool. Madison Square Garden, there's yeah. the Jumbotron. Yeah. Paul McCartney, you know, big round of applause. Yeah. And then the model stands yeah. up. And then Dallas yeah. stands and up. Nobody stands up. And they applaud me, too. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. It's the, most, it's the most applause I've ever gotten in my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know. You get a lot of applause here. Yeah, but small crowds, man. Hey, hey, yeah, but crowd. this is the crowd that matters. <laughs> That's true. So... All right, well, listen, I, I know you and I want to finish that bottle of Knob Creek, and I we know do. you're dying for a cigarette. Yeah, that's true. Um, I'm not going to keep you. I could keep you here for this two days. This has been fun. I would kind of like to tie you up in my basement um, and ask you more questions, but I'm you not going to so do that. Up. I am. <laughs> Last question. Um, you know, looking back, I mean, I mean, dude, you've, you've done it all. You've seen it all. You've conquered everything. Is is there anything yet that that you say I still want to do that? I still haven't tried that yet. Are are you pretty content at this point? Mm. I've had a hell of a good run. You have, uh, and and I'm pushing seventy, a few months away from seventy. Yeah. Um, looking back on it, I wouldn't change much of anything. No. Uh, nope. Um, the answer to that, I guess, is that, you know, I, uh, if there's another book that comes around that, that I feel like I really want to do, I, I'll do it. Yeah. There's nothing pushing me to do anything. No more worlds left to conquer. No. Well, I didn't look at worlds conquering anyway. I just wanted to. I wanted a job where I could do what I wanted to do and nobody would push me around. It's really all I wanted. Yeah. And I got that. And I wanted a lot of uh, love in my life, and I got that too. And so. Uh, if something comes along, I'm going to grab it. And if it doesn't, I'm very content. Amen to that. Well, I love you, and 
God damn it, yeah, you taught me not to let anybody push me around. All right, so. my friend, that's good. It's all your fault. I am all your fault. <laughs> <laughs> they can all blame you. I'll take the blame. <laughs> all right, Jack Ketchum, ladies and gentlemen. Now we will go back to the studio where Dave is waiting patiently and thinking, God damn it, Stephen Kozanowski showed me up. Stephen, you want to say hi to Dave? Hi, Dave. Hi, Dave. All right, Dave, back to you. This week's show is brought to you by the following. Pinky swears and double dog dares. Spit in your hand and shake. Tonight we ride. Hold tight, don't slide. That'd be your last mistake. Creposa Woods is a spooky dark place, even in the daytime. There are creepy crawlies and slithery slimies lurking behind every tree and under every rock, ready to reach out and snatch you away, never to be heard from again. Ghosts float in the misty fog that hangs in the air amid the branches. Some say serial killers and psychopaths bury their unsuspecting victims in shallow graves way far back from the psychopath that meanders through it, and the ghosts are all that remain. Are you scared yet, Frady Cats? Cool, then grab your bikes and let's go for the ride of your lives. Meanderings of a dark and lonely psychopath, uh, or, um, psychopath, Randy D's third dark poetry collection can be found at all the normal book buying locations and several copies are buried in the shallow grave way far back from the cycle path. That's if you're really dying to read it. Pick up your paperback copy or Kindle ebook copy and give this horror poem tome a good home. Horror fiction fans, brace yourselves for the double barrel horror volume two from Pint Bottle Press. The entire second series of chapbooks is now available in a single paperback anthology, as well as for your Kindle device. Six talented authors bring you 12 twisted tales for twice the nightmares. Edited by Matthew Weber, this pulse-pounding anthology includes two stories each from John Bowden, Simon Dewar, Patrick Freivald, Chad Lutsky, Karen Runge, and M.B. Vuchasek. Shane D. Keene of Shotgun Logic writes, like the dual blasts from a sawed-off shotgun, these 12 stories pack a brain-shedding wallop that kept me turning pages as fast as my fingers could tap the screen. Also available from Pint Bottle Press is the original Double Barrel Horror Collection, featuring six different authors, 12 hair-raising stories, and enough thrills and chills to choke a corpse. Pick up the Double Barrel Horror Anthologies at Amazon today. Only eleven ninety nine for paperback and two ninety nine for Kindle. And find more horror fiction at pintbottlepress.com. If there's something you want to talk to us about, hit us up on Twitter, Facebook, or our website. Uh, the Horror Show is available not on iTunes. Well, let's hope that by the time you hear this, that it's resolved. Right. But it is available soon. on Android, Roku, Stitcher, Google Play Music, iHeartRadio, and all other platforms via the Project Entertainment Network. It's also available on the Project Entertainment Network's website. It's also available at the Horror Show with BrianKeen.com. Go there, click Show Archives, and you can listen to all 133 episodes of our nonsense. Most importantly, to advertise on the Horror Show, send an email to Dave. His email address is Meteor Notes. Meteor notes at gmail.com how do people who make stuff up for a living make stuff up new york times bestseller jonathan mayberry told us oprah's book club favorite sue miller told us you know you sort of take a character and make some bad things happen how we get them to do that we colored them just like at a cocktail party except through your headphones join us every thursday for the liars club podcast a slightly unhinged podcast where storytellers interview other storytellers available on project entertainment network i iTunes and everywhere podcasts are heard.